Good evening and welcome back. This is Christian Bible Chapel and we thank you for uh, joining us for our evening uh, worship service. We're continuing our series of expository preaching and dealing with the subject at hand in the book of Acts, the goal and the mission of the church. The church must set up its goal and objectives and that goal is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ as men of God in the pulpit and as saints of God to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing more should be carried on in the church. Nothing more should be carried on in the church. Our goal, our purpose for Christ allowing the church to stay in existence on earth is to share the gospel message with the lost, just as someone shared it with us. Nothing more. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, bless us as a people of God that we will wake up and realize our purpose and mission on this earth is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. As you had your mission when you came, you kept your eye on the goal to die for sinners. And now it is our turn to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Allow us, dear God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to be led to do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Turning your Bibles back to Acts chapter 17, I want to point out, before we go to chapter verses 10 and following, dealing with the Bereans, I want to go back and talk to uh, and, and deal with the, uh, the church in the synagogue, as far as the synagogue, the Jews that met in the synagogue at Thessalonia, or Thessalonica, here in chapter 17 of the book of Acts. As you see in verse 30, the scripture tells us they were that the apostles, as his manner is, he went into the synagogue since the Jews refused at that time refused to come to the church. All right, just like in many countries or areas and districts, you seldom find a Jewish Orthodox Jew, a, 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 a very strict Jew, coming to a Gentile church, whether white or black or Asian or whatever race it is, they're not coming to the church. So Paul says, well, when I dock on land and when I come back, what I'm going to do is first head to the synagogue and talk to people, the Jewish people, about Christ. So that's exactly what he did. Paul made a custom of doing this and the scripture says in verse 3, he opening and allowing that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preached unto you is the Christ. Now the word Christ is the Messiah. Now, in the Roman Empire, they had Caesars as king. They had Julius Caesar, uh, they had emperors, they had Octavius Caesar, they had Augustus Caesar, nephews, the family, they just twinkled down to the family, the stage in the family. They had Claudius Caesar. Now, the point I'm making is that the Roman Caesars, all of them, set out to conquer uh, the world. Marcus Aurelius, all right, who was the Caesar at the time in 100, uh, uh, AD 100 and something, that's the filming of the uh, movie Gladiator, Marcus Aurelius, and they conquered the barbarians, the Vikings, the Gauls, and that's their purpose. The reason I'm saying is that Jesus came not into the world to set up a kingdom or to conquer any nation or the world. He said so in his own words, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my army, my angels would would have fought for me. So Jesus did not come to set up a kingdom. His very purpose was to come as the Messiah, as Paul says here, as Luke writes about what Paul did. He came to suffer, to die, and to be rise again the third day. Now, to get it plain, this person that went through this is Jesus, who is the Christ. Now, we found out in verse 5, Acts 17, 5, 
that many of the Jews believed on him. Right? Extraordinary, there were prominent Jewish men and women that received the message of Paul. Let's go to verse 10. Keeping your focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ and every episode that we turn to, whether it's Thessalonians, whether it's Berea, whether it's Athens, if you keep on going through the book of Acts, Iconium, Derby, Lostra, you find out that the only thing that Paul preached was the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. Turn your attention, before we get to Acts chapter 17 and 10, notice what, what had happened in Iconium, in the district of Iconium, where lies the citizens of Lostra and Derby. That's where young Timothy, Paul found young Timothy at. The scripture says in verse 7, they, where they continue to preach the gospel. See that in verse 7. Acts 14, 7. Acts 14, 7. You're going to find a continuous mention of a couple of things here. They continue to preach the gospel. And then what the results of it, many people came to the Lord. Out of those two things, that's what should be going on in the church as far as witnessing and preaching the gospel so people can get saved. The church back then did not commit themselves to dance clubs, rummage sales, talent shows, entertainment, gong shows, parties, bingos, raffle tickets, selling variety shows, comedian shows, and all that in the church. And this is what's taking place and much more in the church today. Nowhere the scriptures lay out that we are to be involved in such activities. It's the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? It is the telling people about the work of Jesus Christ, the, the, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and further discipling those who have received Christ in the word of God, that is, teaching them as in, in the word of God. Okay. But I think and I believe that the church has varied from that as John, in writing in his last writing in the book of Revelation, to the church of Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3. He states how that the church was not hot, it wasn't even cold, it was lukewarm. Jesus said he wished that he, his church was either hot or cold, but by, because they were lukewarm, the scripture says he would spew them out of their mouths. The church involvement in a lot of activities has caused the church, especially in these last days, to become lukewarm. The church no longer is showing the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and changing things in the hearts of people through the ministry of the Holy Spirit so people can be saved and grow in the Word of God. And this is the reason why we are going through the book of Acts to point out what took place in the early church. It dominated the scene in the early church to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right? Acts 17.10 as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were more noble of character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if Paul was saying the truth. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent, prominent Greek women and many men. Now, two things came about the preaching of the gospel. Number one, many believed. As a result of that, many believed. And this is the reason why it is so important for the church to preach the gospel. 
Now, last Sunday, we talked about how that when Paul entered the Jewish synagogue in Thessalonica, chapter 17, verses 1 to uh, 4, we found out that Paul went into the synagogues and reasoned with these Jewish people from the scriptures. And obviously, it wasn't the book of Acts, it wasn't the four gospels, it wasn't the epistles, it wasn't the epistles in Revelation, it wasn't the book of Revelation. They reasoned among themselves in the Old Testament scriptures. That's the scriptures that they had in the early church. That was the reason why Jesus allowed wonders, miracles, signs, and wonders to be performed to vindicate the preaching of the gospel by their prophets, the apostles, and the elders in the early church. Once the scriptures was established and began to be enforced in the church little by little there was a decrease in signs wonders miracles and healing so why is the church doing trying to be a carbon copy in the spiritual gift section of the book of acts instead of preaching the gospel of jesus christ and teaching people the word of god the church is doing the opposite they have grabbed hold of signs and wonders and miracles and prophetic utterances instead of doing what Jesus wanted them to do. So therefore, he reasoned with them in the scriptures, explaining, see, look at that, verse 2, as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on the third Sabbath, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Now, many Jews, even today, will not accept a conquering Messiah. They look at the Messiah as a conquering hero, as one as equal or greater than David. The scriptures speaks of the Messiah beginning with Genesis 3.15 and scattered throughout until we get to the book of Acts, it speaks of a suffering Messiah. It speaks of a dying Messiah. It speaks of a Messiah that's going to be dead, put to death, and rise the third day and coming back the second time. The Jewish people don't want to hear that. Even though the scriptures plainly shows it, it, it it's evident, so you wonder why during the time of Jesus and during the time even right now, it is so difficult for Jews, even today, to receive Jesus as the Messiah. Well, the point of the matter is, as Isaiah had already prophesied, that he has given them a, 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 a blind eye, their mind has been hardened, and they, he's given them a stiff, hardened heart and a stiff neck. And the purpose of that is to gain the attention of the Gentiles and bring them into the fold and make them one as Jew and Gentile. Had God had kept the Jews open to the reality that the Messiah is coming and that he's going to suffer and die, many Jews would eagerly received the Messiah, but there was a point had to be made to keep many Jews from receiving Christ while allowing Gentiles to come into the fold. Now, to prove that point, to prove that point, I want you to go back again to the scriptures, okay, in Acts chapter 13. Turn back to Acts 13, 40. 42, uh, 44, and I'm going to be reading from the NIV. Acts 13, 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowd, see, it was not only Jews, but it was proselytes, Gentiles, Arabs, all kinds of people of race, nationality, turned out to hear Paul and Barnabas. When the Jews, verse 45, saw the crowds, they were filled with 
jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heap abuse on Paul. Paul was the main speaker. But when Paul and Silas answered them boldly, this is what he said. He answered them boldly. In, in, in verse 40, 46 now. So when Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you Jews put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of the everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now mark this now. Watch this. And when the Gentiles, see a Gentile is anyone who's not a Jew. You, you can be an Arab, you can be an African at that time. I mean a pure blood African, pure blood Arabian, Egyptian, Phoenician, Samarian, right? Cyrenian. You had no Jewish blood in you. you. You were in that spot at that time, on that particular Sabbath day, you're there in that inclusive area where Paul is preaching the gospel. All right? And they were filled with... Now notice what the scripture says. Seeing that you have put this thing afar off. All right? so it was necessary that we first come to you to preach the gospel because salvation is to the Jew first. John chapter 4. Jesus said that, go not into the way of the Samaritans or the Gentiles, but, but, but stay in the area of the Jewish people, for the Jews must get the salvation first, then the Gentiles. We, we, we get the bread to the Gentiles, the, to the Jews, excuse me, the bread to the Jews, and any crumbs from the bread that is left over, we give it to the Gentiles. That's a parable of what Jesus and the woman was talking about. The woman told Jesus at one occasion, yes, Lord, the bread does belong to the Jews, but at least the Gentiles get the crumbs. And that's how the message of the gospel began its course. Now follow me now. Let me, let's pick up now. Let me reread verse 46. Then Paul and Silas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to us to you, excuse me. But seeing you Jews put it far from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so had the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set you Jews to be a light to the Gentiles. Now this is the book of Isaiah. Isaiah says this now. Right? You are to be a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, verse 48, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. Notice, and as many as or ordained, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Now notice this because we're going back to Acts 17 and, 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 and verse 10 and following. Have you ever wondered you see in scriptures, in the book of Acts, we're talking about it. How the numbers, 2,000 people were saved. 3,000 people were saved. The whole household was saved. Prominent men and women were saved. Have you ever wondered why Luke put such detailed writings in his letter, in his words here, as he wrote the book of Acts? Why did he pause to say what is the number of people coming to God? This is the reason. Because there is a elect certain amount of crowd of people whom God from eternally past whom God foreknew that he will save. He has, excuse me, so pulled out within the whole realm of the human population, what he has done is, as God, is that he has chosen certain individuals from Adam to the last person to spend eternity with him. That speaks, this Peter himself speaks of this in his epistle 
to the people or the Gentiles who are scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Asia. That's 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me read that. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect, elect, chosen one, elect, Okay, chosen one. See, the word elect is is a very familiar word to the Jewish language. They, they know about, because see, they know that they are the elected ones. See, if you are all the time or once a, once elected to be president or elected to do this and elect, and you won the election, but when election comes up again, I'm, I'm, I'm using a human metaphor, and you don't, and, and, and you see all these people come out for the same office, you, you get jealous, you get upset because it's possible that you might lose, okay? And somebody else might win the election. This was what's happening to the Jews. This is how the Jews felt. They didn't want anyone to get saved. They only want the salvation to them and their children. No Gentile. So Peter uses the word elect, an expressive word that the Jewish people were very familiar with. Now when the Gentiles caught from Paul's mouth that he said that God is now going to save the Gentiles, because you Gentiles had been elected from the foundation of the world, they were glad, they were honored, and they received the word of God. See, that's why it's so important to constantly, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, to preach the gospel and preach the word, the word, the word of God. Paul said to Timothy, preach the word, nothing more. Preach the word. And see, it, that's, it is so important to do that because God has a plan. And within that plan, there are elected individuals scattered around the world in your district, in your area, in your church, on your job, in the streets, in the marketplace that, will, that needs to hear the gospel message. Failure to preach the, the, the direct truth from the scriptures concerning the gospel, it, it doesn't throw things off. No, it, it doesn't throw God off. We think it does, but it doesn't. It doesn't do harm because the elect is going to be saved. And those who are elected from the foundation of the world, God will allow them to meet up with dedicated True Christians who are preaching the truth of the gospel message in order for them to be saved. Let me finish reading in Peter now. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. See, God foreknew. That's what the word foreknowledge, a knowledge that was already knew. God foreknew who the elect are. In the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy, the scripture says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stand for sure. The Lord knows them that are his. Right? The elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. See, this is the reason why, see what I just read in Peter. This is the reason why Jesus says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father. Why? Because of the foreknowledge of God the Father. Baptize them in the name of the Son through the sprinkling and the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Baptize them in the name of the Holy Ghost because he sanctifies or set them apart. 
each person of the Godhead has a particular mission to carry out, to bring about the salvation of the elect, of the elect, the chosen one. And the Greek is ek lego, ek, e-ek, E-K, ek, out of, lego, out of, to bring them out of darkness, to bring them out of the kingdom of Satan, to bring them out of sin, ek, that's the Greek word for out, out, ek, lego, chosen, elect, according to the foundation and foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctification of the Spirit. Witnessing for Jesus Christ is so important to the believer in Christ. It should be. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to use the believer to sp help spread the gospel because the believer in Christ, the average Christian outside of church, should be spreading the gospel, the truth of the gospel message wherein the elder in the church he constantly preach the gospel preach the gospel and preaching the gospel involves in preaching about Jesus Christ son of God that he is the Messiah came into the world to suffer and die on the cross was died and rose again the third day and is coming back that through repentance and faith in him Jesus the Messiah the Christ you can have eternal life. When that message goes out in this fullness, the, what the Holy Spirit does when that message goes out, the unbeliever heart is drawn to that message. That drawing is that drawing by the Holy Spirit is is, is part of what we, what the Scripture says: being born again or new generation. The drawing of the Holy Spirit of God brings a, a company, is accompanied with conviction. That accompanies also with a change of heart and a change of mind. I was talking to a person while I was on break outside and I was talking to them and, and letting them know that being born again or regeneration is when God changes the heart and mind of a person in order for them to receive the gospel message that they might be saved. Because a wicked heart, a dull mind, a deaf ear, a blind eye cannot receive the gospel message. And so therefore it takes the Holy Spirit to awaken them. He says to them, wake up, wake up, I want to save you. He brings the drawing and the convictions in their heart and their mind. So when they hear the gospel, the true gospel message, they are aroused spiritually, admits to God that they have broken God's law and that they are a sinner. They immediately repent of their sins and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's how every, every individual is truly, truly saved. Any person that is saved other than that, that's the scriptures. They cannot be saved, truly saved. If this gospel be hid, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it is hidden to those that are lost on whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. See, the average person on this planet is blind. And when I mean average, if they're not saved, they're blind to the truth. You can be in church and still be blind to the true truth. You can be baptized and still be blind to the truth. You can be dedicated to the Lord's work and still be blind to the truth. You can be christened and still be blind to the truth. 
regardless of your denomination or church affiliation, if you're not born again, saved by the grace of God, you're still blind. Spiritually blind. Captive by Satan, the world, and the flesh. The church job and mission is to arouse people up by means of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where in the church, you know how the church is arousing people? They have fashion shows. They have dances, festivals, bingos, all kinds of settings. You know, comedians come in and tell jokes. They have festivals. They have rummage sales. See, all that brings in both the saved and unsaved. That's not the gospel. That's not what God wanted the church to do. But the church, nevertheless, is doing these things. See, they, they feel that if I want to draw young people, then I got to have some hip-hop in my style, in my behavior, in my actions, in my ways. That'll bring in. The scripture says, if I be lifted up in a spiritual manner, I will draw all men. It's not through your lyrics. It's not through your music. It's not, the, see, you can fashion your music in a hip-hop manner, in a black style, blackism manner, in a country manner, in whatever folklore or lyrics as you want. Unless the Spirit of God draws, that person is not still not going to get saved. So it's, it's a waste of time. you got to get the message. Young people, children, adults, and seniors need to hear the unadulterated gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that they might be saved. We have too many people who are coming within the church with a hip-hop manner, with a Hollywood-style thing, with a movie characteristic, with a play, with all this comedians and every show and everything, the church is adapting the style, behavior, and lyrics, and words, and wording of the world to pacify the church, to get young people and adults in the church instead of telling them the truth behind the matter. Repent of your sin. You, you don't have to, <coughs> excuse me, name fornication, adultery, stealing, murder, and etc., lying, manipulation, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't need to stand on this street corner and say, God God hates your sin. God hates you as being a gambler. God hates you as being a murderer. You're a prostitute. You know, all you need to do is preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That message is that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Son of God, came into the world to die on the cross for sin. You explain or each one of those phrases. You explain why he came, what he did, who he is. You explain about sin, what sin does. You explain the consequences, the wages of sin. This stirs up a person's heart because of the Holy Spirit. We need to follow the pattern as Peter and the rest of the apostles as they preach the gospel. Nothing but the gospel. Can you imagine Peter stepping out on a balcony in Acts chapter 2 and waving his hands and says, I know some of you have a, a strong feeling, and I know some of you are lonely and depressed. I know some of you have negative feelings and you want to be positive about yourself. I know some of you are not working and some of you need help in your home, in your relationship. You have broken marriages. You have come to Jesus. Peter didn't do that. The church today is doing that. That's not preaching the gospel. That's a social gospel. That's not the real gospel. It sounds smooth and fascinating, but it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church is preaching a prosperity gospel, a social gospel, a civil rights gospel, a political gospel. Huh? It, it, you got so many types and styles of gospels, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it's dictated by whether it's the ethnic or group of race that is in that congregation. 
And so they hammered on that. Had Peter got out of there in Acts chapter 2 and, 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 and preached the similar message that a lot of preachers and churches are doing today, do you really think thousands of people on the day of Pentecost would have came to Christ? No, they would have came to church. See, that's the point. We're building empires. We're building numbers and churches and people in the church, but people are not coming to Christ. Their lives have, has not been changed. They're still practicing sin. They're still indulging in their old lifestyle or their present lifestyle. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5, if any person be in Christ, they are a new creation. Now listen to the conclusion of this matter in dealing with how the church should be preaching the gospel. These Bereans, Acts 17 and 11, were more noble than those in Thessalonians. They received the message that Paul, you know, preached. And they were eager to hear Paul preach. But at the same time, they examined the scriptures, word to God, that we would see the scriptures as the scriptures as they are. Many will fight and debate that you have to be baptized, you have to believe, then you get saved. You know, easy believism. You don't need to repent. There's no need for the Holy Spirit to change your heart, change your mind. See, Peter got out out there and he says repent see we as Gentiles we have to take our time and explain this word repent it's not a word often from the poor case that you hear you hear people say Jesus loves you repent Jesus loves you believe Christ believe in Jesus say this prayer bow your head say this prayer there's a prayer you need to pray and after you say this prayer you are saved the scripture doesn't teach that. The scripture doesn't teach an altar call. It doesn't teach a mourner's bench. It doesn't teach waving your hand, holding your hand up for a blessing. This is what the crowd wants. Peter stood up and said, repent. And in each, and even down right now, in the book of Acts 17, the word is still used, repent. Repent. You repent of your sins. And repenting of your sins is you acknowledging God that you are a sinner, that you have broken his law. Through the mercy and the power of God, you want to be changed. Change of heart, change of mind, change of life, change of behavior of who you think God is involves repentance. Faith, faith is believing without a sign, without a miracle, without a wonder, without a feeling. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That is not being preached a whole lot in our churches today. And that's why we have a lot of pseudo-false Christians. These, these Christians, these people, they examine and say, well, let's, let, me, let me see if Isaiah 53, Isaiah 44, Isaiah 45, Psalms 22, Psalms 110, Psalms 89, Genesis 3, uh, 15, Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah 9 and 6, and it goes on, Malachi chapter 3, Malachi chapter 4. Let me see if all these scriptures is what Paul is saying. They group them together and they say, as a result, verse 12, as a result, many believed. But when the Jews, as we close, verse 13, but when the Jews... And Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea. Some of them 
went there too, agitating the crowd, stirring them up. The believers therefore immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. And those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens, then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Now next week, we're going to look at how that Paul, upon arriving at Athens, he was stunned. If Paul or Jesus was to walk the streets of your district, of your area, of your city, of your county, and took note of all what was going on in a religious church manner, they will weep, they will cry because of what's going on in the churches. It has fallen from what Jesus and the apostles started the church in doing. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessed word of God in, within the book of Acts. The mission of the church, the purpose of the church, is to spread the gospel message. But somehow, the local churches has allowed many other sidetracks, worldly, fashionable gimmicks and methods to invade the church and take its place. And then when they preach a gospel, it is a soft pedal, God-denying, bloodless, faithless, true faithless gospel. Arouse the people of God that are truly yours, that we may go into all the people and share and proclaim the gospel message that elders will continue to preach the gospel and then exhort them to study the word of God after salvation and grow in the grace of God. We thank you, Father, for thine word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.